So my primary hypothesis is that rather than seeking out new mental and self-growth opportunities, right, the actions of ASD infants are dominated by that need to maintain stability. Okay? They avoid engaging in any situations that they perceive as disorganizing, um, and they seek out settings and activities that they experience as what we call stability maintaining. Okay. Remember growth seeking and the two drives of growth seeking and stability maintaining. Well, what, what I believe happening, it, it happens initially is not that something goes wrong or gets worse, but that growth seeking just does not get activated. So what happens is that what you see is a child that continues to be dominated by maintaining the stability of their internal and external world due to their vulnerabilities. And we're talking about many possible combinations of vulnerabilities today. ASD infants fail to develop what we call the foundations or prerequisites to activate that growth seeking. Experience sharing foundations, again, when you, you see at six months, may not be developing. The capacity for internal organization, there's a new model out that says that they don't develop sufficient invariance detection. They're not able to manage um, variations as a part of something they've already seen, you know, different but same is the, is the way I like to talk about it. And they don't develop what we call the categorical breadth, the more conceptual categories that allow you to handle variations and still see, still label something as the same, right? So they're cognitively having difficulty then managing increasing complexity, diversity, variability, and congruity. And it wind up rather than being sort of another piece of, of a category you already have or a little extension of an existing category, for instance, it becomes a disorganizing or a disruptive element, right? And you can't assimilate it. Or they might have not developed sufficient capacity for emotional mediation to handle growth seeking. And that includes being able to access the support of parents to help them, right? They might not develop a perception of themselves as active agents capable of self-regulating, co-regulating, goal attaining. And I think, again, the most important component is the inability to form strong emotional memories, positive emotional memories of parent guides providing them with a route to attaining greater experience sharing, organization, mediation, agency to be able to promote their growth that in a safe way, that even though those, those experiences may happen, I'm not saying they never happen, they don't develop and they can't access those strong memories that integrate their own increased competence with their parent guiding, with their parent support, with their parent providing that for them. And so they don't develop those what we call shared relationship memories. And what's interesting is if we look downstream, which we will at a later time, and we look at some of the most powerful, permanent impairments of people on the spectrum, even the highest functioning people, they have to do with emotionally based memories and being able to form and then later recollect and access critical, significant moments in an integrated way that makes sense. So interestingly enough, we may see some of that right in the first year. So what's the impact of not grossing being dominated by stability maintaining? And what you'll see here is you'll see minimum primitive exploration. These are kids who are not motivated to develop their ability to explore their world because you might encounter something, right, that you don't want to encounter. So rather you're going to have a preference for very repetitive behavior, but not for mastery, not picking hard things and working at them because you might fail or get frustrated, but sort of repetitive behavior that maintains stability is doing something over and over again. Certainly avoidance of novelty, right? The lack of desire for social observation, the lack of desire for social referencing, and the lack of desire for experience sharing. So you, you really see a different motivational issue. Now, why do I talk about motivation rather than skill as an impact? And this is really important, and you'll see this later. When you look at the research on um, ASD infants, and for instance, their experience sharing uh, is one example, um, the research, if we talked about the fact that ASD is characterized by a lack of ability to conduct experience sharing, right, we should see then 100% of children who 
are diagnosed with ASD cannot do it, right? It just can't do it. But that's not the case. What we see is a dramatically lower incidence of experience sharing among the ASD infants and toddlers. That doesn't increase. We also see that it doesn't grow. It doesn't become more sophisticated. But we do see a large minority of these children occasionally engaging in it. So if you can do it once in a while, it means you can do it. It's just they don't do it. They don't have a desire to do it. And, and eventually, most of them do have the ability to do it. Again, the ability does not lead them to do it. The other thing is when we see kids with Down syndrome, or we even see blind, congenitally blind children, an even more powerful example, you say, well, how in the heck do they do experience sharing? Well, what we see is the vast majority of children born blind are very delayed, as you would think, in experience sharing, but they do start to do it, and they start to do it at the same frequency as typically developing children. So they become just, as, once they figure out how to do it without being able to see, they become just as motivated. Same thing with kids with Down syndrome. The only group that doesn't are the kids with autism. If you look at these seven areas, those are the seven areas that would indicate the failure to activate growth seeking and a dominance of stability maintaining. So we look at things like primitive and infrequent exploration. So here's some studies that have been done, you know, so all recent, and we see more restrictive primitive exploration, less frequent, uh, explored fewer images, perseverated on the images, provided themselves with fewer opportunities to learn about their environment, demonstrating less looking at novel object, less object exploration. There's really nothing here to guide. If you're perseverating, if it's very primitive, you can't follow, you can't respond to that. You can't pick up on it and elaborate it. And secondly, of course, even when they're doing that, they're not providing you with the attentional space. They're not inviting you into it. Same thing, what we call non-functional repetitive behavior. As opposed to typically development, in typical development, infants and young children do a lot of repetitive behavior, but it's for mastery. And once they master something in a skill, they move on to something else. They don't stay with something. And what we see here is study after study where the ASD infants and toddlers and young children have a perseverative repetitive behavior that has nothing to do with mastery, say, uh, the quote from a very recent study. For infants with ASD, the persistence of invariant behavior may crowd out opportunities for adaptive, increasingly complex responses to novel demands. Now, only one study back in 2009, where when offered the choice, 30-month-old uh, ASD children, clearly all preferred engaging with familiar objects, while the Down syndrome kids and the typically developing kids all preferred the novel objects. So it was just complete discrepancy there. Great study by Schick in 2011. And what amazed me is it's the only study of social observation. I'm not talking about imitation. I'm just talking about how much do these at-risk infants actually look around and watch their environment and pay attention to what's going on around them socially. And one study that showed the toddlers, um, when, when parents offered, actually offered, remember we're not talking about uh, the infant doing anything to engage, which would be the normal thing. Here are parents proactively offering facial and vocal expressions in relationship to novel objects. The infants didn't, didn't even look, the ASD infants, compared to the typical ones. And the conclusion was they do not appear to be affected by feedback based on parents' facial expressions or voice tones, actually, or vocalizations, which is very abnormal. Um, and in fact, they would be the, should be the ones initiating it. And here's another study by Bedford, and their group, big group, another big group, where they were giving ASD toddlers and typically developing toddlers a task that was, was a bit difficult to do. And in both groups, parents were able to provide supportive feedback or guidance, right, to that infant. And the ASD, ASD toddlers just didn't attend to it. They didn't listen, they didn't pay attention to it. And the conclusion was very clear. They either ignored or didn't appreciate the feedback they received. Now we get to the, the thing that most of the research has done, which is called social passivity and non-responsiveness. So, you know, not being, not engaging with guides who would be trying to promote their growth. And this, the conclusions of research, so here's Rosga, a very big prospective study. By the end of their first year, typically developing infants are active participants in social interaction. ASD infants are not. That's the conclusion. Uh, Muratori in Italy, ASD infants made few attempts to maintain their social engagements. St. George, um, again, a large research group, 
Social passivity was the strongest diagnostic marker, especially their, their failure to initiate social interaction. You can see that from the videos. Barbara and Desayanke, deficits in initiating interaction with the things that most clearly distinguished ASD infants from their typically developing peers, as well as Downs or developmentally disabled infants. Less liveliness, fewer invitations to engage, made less effort to maintain engagement were less lively. In contrast to TD infants, this is back to the Italian group, the concluded that the critical difference between ASD and TD infants was in the former's lack of initiation. Now we get to experience sharing, and that's been a huge area of study. For some reason, all the study then gets done there, and it's an important area. And it just over and over again, the replications are unbelievable, starting in 2006. You know, significantly less experience sharing at 12 months, at 14 months, again at 12 months, an impoverished repertoire. Um, here's one that looked at a community study, a large sample at 18 months. None of the language in developmentally disabled infants had deficits in showing objects compared to all the infants in the ASD group that they had. Now, what's interesting is they caught up at 12 months, the language and developmentally disabled infants did have deficits in showing or in, in earlier versions of experience sharing. By 18 months, they had caught up with the typically developing kids. ASD kids had flattened out half the number of experience sharing gestures at 13 months. Difficulties is the best indicator of emerging age. This is a review article by Tony Sharman. And then the other issue is not just so much do they do it or not, but over the course of the second year, you see a dramatic increase in both the frequency and the sophistication, the functions and the means of how typically developing children engage in experience sharing. You start to see pointing, you start to see showing, and what we find here is that there's no growth at all. Uh, no improvement over second, third, and fourth years, no improvement between nine and 24 months. While developmentally and language delayed children, this is Makari, catch up in the second year, Deficits in showing and initiating during tend to persist and become some of the defining features of ASD. Watson, both an extremely limited repertoire and no improvement in frequency. In Winder, just a recent study, at 18 months, their entire ASD sample, the kids that went on to have ASD, at 18 months, produced only two spontaneous experience sharing gestures over a five-minute observation. That's, that's a total for their entire sample. Again, what's striking here, and, and, I, and I like videos like this because you're going to see these, it's not that the child is doing something so horrible or so bizarre, but you can see two things already. One is, unlike a typically developing child in the second year, this child is making no attempts, right, to engage, creating no attentional space for parents. He's having very primitive interactions with his world. There's absolutely no attempt or no even the conception of experience sharing here that's going on and his experience is all very primitive as well but and, and you also notice the adults are doing so much directiveness they're doing so much work and getting no effort but you know they keep doing such directive things you know again not bad things loving things happy things but they're doing so much work there he is with his easter egg Full of candy. He doesn't know. And it sounds Ryan, low, but what do you got, boo -boo? hopefully you'll hear. Oh. Even if you don't hear the sound, it's really not that important. Sissy, you're so nice to play with little man. Mother continues to try to talk. His little sister tries to engage. Yeah. Now he's shaking the Easter egg. He's looking at things. He's doing some very primitive exploring. Mom's saying, Ryan, Ryan. Nothing. Very abnormal. You know, the amount of calling the name and, you know, is not something you would ever do with a typically developing child to get their attention. 
And now she's making noises, Ryan, you know, all these, uh, all this effort spending just to, just to attain attention or redirect attention. Look at Mama. But the problem is, even if he looks at Mama, there's not any point in it because he's not going to look in terms of experience sharing or inviting her in. So even if she gets him to look, there's not much gain there. So he, you know, he takes an A, he takes this candy, but nothing really, you know, he's not doing anything that would be mastering, anything that would be more meaningful based exploring, putting in his mouth, it's candy, you can eat it. But you can see, there is nothing here, there's no way to be a guy at this point. Ryan, what do you got, honey? And so she's like, what do you got, honey? What are you doing? Making noises, trying to attract his attention. It doesn't really matter, does it? And we see this child of 20 months. It's a similar type of thing. It's amazing how you can sort of see the Michael Gross scene. He's watching. There's a TV going on there. Remy. Remy, what are you making? Yeah, and they have no response. Remy, what are you making? The most devastated consequence is the ASD infants losing access at a very young age to a guiding relationship for a lifetime. And that's a very powerful piece. And why? It's because they don't provide the energy for growth.